In this video, we're going to have a look at the notion of an AI agent, uh, which is another way of saying it is um, an entity, a character, a, an opponent, whatever, within our game, that we have some algorithm behind it that um, gets it to behave with the, the appearance of purpose, with drive of, of a particular desire, of a particular goal. It's going to be a fairly common thing to have in a lot of um, games uh, in, in terms of letting the player think that um, they are interacting with uh, some other entities in their environment. Um, though there's going to be a wider range of different algorithms from the very, very simple to the quite complex that will underpin just how sophisticated uh, the behaviour of the AI agent can be. I'll start off first of all with uh, a broad definition, because uh, the notion of an agent is, is an, uh, an aspect or from artificial intelligence. So it's not specific to games. It refers to a particular class or category of, um, of, of autonomous uh, agent of a piece of software. And you can define it here as um, an autonomous agent is a system, so a piece of software, situated within and uh, a part of an environment that senses that environment, so it has the notion of trying to understand the environment within which it finds itself, and then acts upon that over time in pursuit of its own agenda, and so as to affect what it senses in the future. So in other words, it's part of some environment, it senses that environment, it has a set of goals that it's trying to do, and it takes actions to try to realise and to move closer to those goals. From a view of a game, uh, an agent may be an opponent, um, maybe an ally, maybe a neutral character um, to the player. And the, in terms of decomposition of what it does, it, it actually breaks up into a number of reasonably simple steps. Uh, so you see there in the bottom that for an AI agent or entity, it loops through a number of uh, steps where it senses about the world, it then thinks about what it senses, and then acts upon that. There can be optional steps beyond this, things like remembering or learning, uh, where it then tries to change potentially its, its behaviour uh, based on what it senses in terms of the effectiveness of the actions that it's taking. So we'll go through these, but we're going to look at a number of different things over the next few lectures. But here we're just going to simply introduce um, the, the, the different stages of that key loop in terms of sensing, thinking and then acting. Uh, for sensing, first of all, I mean, to, to a degree, certainly within a game, uh, potentially sensing can be trivial because if you've got an opponent that is part of some level class, you can, if you want, have perfect information uh, within that in terms of being able to know where every other character or entity is, where the player is, what's the player's status, abilities and things like that. That often isn't uh, fair or the, the player would perceive it as not being fair. So quite often you want to put in uh, a sense model for your AI agent that will limit what it can find or it can see within the environment that it finds itself. This really is to simulate, if you like, some of the limitations that, that I suppose we would have in terms of, of only being able to sense certain regions or aspects of our environment. So we, we do this here to avoid the notion of cheating. Uh, there's lots of different ways you can do it, so I'll just give you one illustrative example here. So if we assume that our green uh, circle is the player, and the red circle, is, or the green player is the AI agent, and the red circle are all of the things around that particular agent. Now, potentially, it can have access to all of those. It'll know whereabouts it is relative to itself, how far they're away, so on and so forth. Things we could put in to provide them a, a common sensing model. Um, quite often, entities will have a maximum distance beyond which they can't notionally sense anything. Uh, so there we, we give it a maximum, um, if, if you like, um, awareness distance. And you can see there's one red obstacle or object that falls outside of that. So that notionally is not available to the entity in terms of being uh, able to be aware of it. I mean, there is caution in all of this, because quite often in games, if, if the player is still able to see the entity and interact with the entity and is outside of its sense range, um, you don't want the entity to come across as, as, as sort of not moving, not doing anything. That would appear to be sort of a dumb response uh, to that type of action. Beyond that, we are going to put in a viewing arc. 
Um, so the entity is going to be facing in a certain direction and it's only able to be aware of the things that notionally it sees within its cone of vision. So again, we could do that for removing a few entities. Additionally, we could also put in line of sight tests. Uh, so there we assume that it finds itself in an environment where there's a number of, for example, walls or other things that can obstruct the view. And we check to see for each of the entities that are within range within our viewing arc, is there anything obscuring them um, that would prevent them from being seen. So that's, that's one example of some of the types of restriction that we can put in to, to better simulate senses, or in this case, the sense of, of vision. Sound is another common sense, and quite often AI entities can use this again to, to, to have an awareness of, of what's around them. They can also use this by way of communication uh, too. Um, so in terms of sound, um, generally speaking, sound is assumed to sort of propagate in all directions. It's more a matter of do you hear it? Uh, you can use distance, you can use zones as a way of of being able to, to have some semblance of, of how sound propagates through the environment. And um, for things like stealth games and so on, the amount of sound that is emitted from a character would depend upon the speed of movement, uh, the type of surface they're going over, and other things like that. But, but again, you can put in that type of sensing model into your environment if you're trying to then give the appearance of something that, that appears plausible. So with uh, the notion of sight, with the notion of sound, um, sensing things that are in your environment, you also tie in the notion of reacting to it. Potentially, as soon as you see the player, you could immediately take an action on that exact same frame but that will appear to be quite unfair, most probably from the player's point of view, because there, in terms of reaction time, we are talking remarkably small reaction time, and certainly faster than, than a person um, could, uh, could possibly react. So if we are trying to have our AI entities as in somehow representing characters or entities or creatures or whatever, we probably will want to put in a delay from when they sense something to when they decide to take an action based on what they sense. And that then is to simulate the, the delay that, that we um, have in terms of, of our particular um, uh, senses. And you can see some examples over here that for vision, quarter to half a second is fairly common for a person. Hearing, again, similar order of magnitude. For communication, if, if something is said, so there you may want to leave a couple of seconds until the the recipient of that sort of triggers some particular action. And again, this is all about trying to, to, to mirror, to, to model, uh, in large part, how people uh, sense and react uh, to their environment. Once we've got our sensing model, the next thing after that is thinking about what we sense. Uh, and that's trying to, to make sense of that in, in terms of the, the what it is is visible, what does that mean, what sort of actions then might we want to, to take as a consequence of it. There's different ways you can implement thinking and there's two broad approaches. One is to use uh, basically expert knowledge. It's where you think, well, what would a sensible person do in this case? And you hard code that in that if you see this or if you find yourself in this situation, then do the following. Uh, the other approach is more of an algorithmic one. Uh, where you will run some type of algorithm to try to investigate something, to maximize or to minimize something, and then take uh, uh, actions based on that. They're not mutually exclusive. You could do both of them together if you wish to. Uh, we're going to spend the next few lectures looking at, at different uh, techniques that can be used to, to think about, to reason about the environment that uh, the A entity finds itself within. Little aside down at the bottom, so for things like expert knowledge, and I was asking about how would a sensible person do, generally speaking, that's information that's readily available, um, but it can be a little bit brittle. So it very much is tied into situation matching and hoping that the advice applies to sort of all common situations uh, around that. For the algorithmic approach, uh, it can be more flexible, can be more scalable, uh, potentially more adaptable. Um, but there, there, there can be sometimes more challenging to get behaviours that are of, that come across as, as representing high quality um, reasoning or high quality thinking. 
Little aside, uh, sometimes you actually do need to dumb down uh, your, um, your, your, your thinking, if you like, and there could be different reasons for this. So for example, if we have a character that is aiming or throwing something towards the player, we can work out precisely and exactly how it is you would want to do that. Um, in terms of how the thing reacts, uh, we could maybe react quite quickly or quite slowly. Or if we have a model in terms of staying in cover, um, because our entity is trying to provide an engaging gameplay experience to the player, we don't want to have something necessarily that makes the life of the player impossible or, or too difficult or presents them with a challenge that they're not capable of overcoming. Uh, so they're in, uh, depending on difficulty level and things like that, you might want to introduce a source of randomness into each shot. You might want to, on occasion, get it to do something you, you think is silly. It's not purposefully to put it in a vulnerable position, simply to present the player with opportunities. Conversely, other than dumbing it down, sometimes you need to actually cheat a little bit and to do things that uh, are not accessible or available to the player. That um, could, for example, mean that you're aware of more things than you really should be aware of, or you give yourself sort of advantages or benefits that the player doesn't have. Often that uh, comes in in games where you want to have um, you know, the most difficult level or you've got a, a difficult form of AI in terms of a large scale tactical or strategic analysis. Um, and maybe it's, it's too much of a challenge to implement AI or there isn't sufficient time to implement AI. Uh, but you still want to provide a strong challenge to, to the best players. After we've um, thought and reasoned about our environment, we then uh, take some actions. And the actions that are taken very much depend upon the character and what's available to it. You can see a list of them here. We might decide to move for a location. We might decide to pick up an, uh, an object, play an animation, play a sound effect, um, shoot, talk to the player whatever it is that is appropriate uh, to the, the game. Now, the acting senses are remarkably important uh, because when the AI entity senses and thinks, the, these are not things that are visible to the player. They happen, they take time, but it's only the actions that the AI entity undertakes that will be visible to the player. So quite often the actions within games are actually there to communicate the thinking. Um, so in a lot of games, you, you will hear the AI agents talking, if you like, oh, I thought I saw somebody over there. Oh, no, I mustn't have saw anybody. They're there purposefully saying things to communicate the outcome of their thought processes. So you want to, to basically let the player know or to have some inkling as to what's going on uh, notionally within their mind. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll have a look at some simple forms of, of action uh, selection that we can use in later lectures. Um, Interagent communication where one object or one agent talks to another one, again, is quite a large uh, and interesting area. Uh, and again, depending on the game, may or may not be relevant. So overall, one takeaway from this that uh, when we're wanting to put an AI-controlled entity, uh, an agent within our game, the most easy way is to break its functionality up into the, the sensing step where you you sense, you work out what you know about the world, a thinking step where you try to make sense of this against whatever goals that you have, and then an action step or an acting step where you take some action that will hopefully help further the goals of that entity. Um, depending on, on the game, you, you may have some either remembering what has worked, what hasn't worked, or some refinement or learning step um, thereafter. But breaking things down in that way gives us quite a nice uh, structure, a framework within which to, to separate out our, our agents and to be able then to start implementing that, uh, the, the behaviour that will define that agent.